so keep keep in mind, please, that this is this is a preview in a way, um, but it's something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, and the title is "Evolving Linux Foundation Project Management in Response to the uh, EU Regulation," because this is primarily what we think about. Um, we're not a lobbying organization. I keep saying that. We're an organization that wants to make sure that our projects can thrive with their collaboration and, and our participants, our uh, contributors can participate in those projects. And um, that's primarily um, what we would like to achieve. And what you see in, in, the, con in the presentation now is a bit more high level, but it's just important to, 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 to know that this is what is on our mind when we, for example, engage in Brussels. Um, I want to point out that in the report that we've just published on the state of open source, um, we said this is a, mo a watershed moment for Europe. And I, to, to illustrate that, I picked two, two things that happened. So in 2019, I participated in a study on the relationship between open source software and standard setting. And in the policy recommendations, one of the things we said is the European Union has not recognized the importance of free and open source software anywhere in its regulatory frameworks. So we said it should do that. Um, it should integrate open source into research and policy frameworks where this is justified by the positive externalities that this ecosystem provides. That was 2019. And unfortunately or fortunately, they actually did that. <laughs> so now we are in 2024. And uh, this is literally a screenshot from chapter two of the Cyber Resilience Act that opens with obligations of economic operators and provisions in relation to free and open source software. So this is the first time that we have a major EU law where it's not just in an article in paragraph three, it's in the title of a chapter of the law. That's new. So if you wonder, like, why do we call this a watershed moment? This is because we believe this is, this is not a one-time thing. Um, we expect that the approaches that have been implemented in this area or are going to be implemented, like the idea, the concept of open source software stewards, that these approaches are going to spill into other regulatory initiatives. So we will continue to see that manufacturers and open source organizations will be treated differently in the law. And um, there is rumor on the shop floor in Brussels that um, there are proponents for a European Open Source Act where the European Union actively wants to like, encourage the development of open source software, I hope. Um, we don't know much about it, but we know that there are newly elected members in the European Parliament that would push for that. So I really think the, the time until now was we were kind of the grassroots movement that was slowly becoming more and more influential. And now it's, uh, we are on the radar of policymakers. Now, if you're wondering what am I talking about, you're probably, if you were here last year, you saw this before, but um, this is the, the overview of the Cyber Resilience Act with its three policy goals to reduce vulnerabilities in digital products, to ensure cybersecurity is maintained throughout the product's lifecycle, and to enable users to make informed decisions when they select and operate these products. And it's a mandatory horizontal regulation that applies to all products sold in the European market and uh, this was all, was all the rage was about last year. We, we basically went to Brussels every month twice and had one consultation after the other. Um, and one thing that's kind of an, an inter interesting, um, like between the lines aspect of the law is that the EU intends to play a leading international role with this regulation on cybersecurity, meaning, and this is actually, this, you find this in the text. This is not hidden, but you have to read the text. It's just 200 pages. Um, and that means where in the past, the, the Brussels effect, like the effect that when the EU regulates something, this regulation spills over into the rest of the world because of the importance of the European market. Um, in, like five years ago, 10 years ago, this was more like an, a surprising effect. And here, the EU plays with it. So which is like a dangerous play, you have to do it right, but um, the series clearly intended to influence the markets globally. So this is just all kind of scene setting for what we want to talk about. Um, where are we with this? Uh, the CRA was approved by the European Parliament in, in March. Um, but as you know, bureaucrats uh, have many steps of approval, so we have one more. It has to go through the EU Council. 
um, where it will be approved finally and then published, and then it has a six weeks publication period, and then you have, you're supposed to have read it, basically. <laughs> and uh, that's going to be in Q4 this year. And then we have two stages of obligations from that starting to, um, to become effective. One is after 21 months, those are the vulnerability reporting obligations. And one is three years later, which is we expect to be late 27 if there are no further delays. Um, so this is the environment we operate in. And now the question is, what do we as Linux Foundation plan to do to implement the obligations from the Act? And um, as I said, this is a bit preliminary because we're waiting for many aspects of the implementation details of the law. But what we would like to achieve is that we establish unified practices and tooling for our projects to provide primarily the documentation that is required for, by manufacturers to, um, to be compliant with the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, this sounds like an absolute obvious uh, path forward, but please keep in mind that we're hosting way over 800 different projects with various different tool chains from operating system kernels with the Makefile-based build system to web frameworks. Now, to, to prepare for all these projects, unified processes is a humongous task. Um, and that's what we're, we're still going to work on this, but this might also take some time. Um, in, in these three years that I've mentioned, there will be, um, I, I go into, this, in, into details more later, there will be uh, a process of developing standards for the implementation of the law. And um, these standards, part, a part of them, will um, prescribe specific requirements for certain types of products, like web browsers. And so we want to enable our projects and members to participate in this process to bring in their expertise and their, um, their interests um, in as the standards are being formulated. This is also something that sounds obvious, but if you are aware how difficult it has been in the past for the open source ecosystem to participate in standards development, um, you realize that this is also not easy. Um, so we're working on that. And then the third like dimension of the strategy, of the goals, is to say we, we need to make uh, our community aware and ready to implement these, this new regulatory environment, which means we're going to um, educate them, um, provide materials, et cetera. And I, I have a few details on what completely this means. How do we approach this? But the good thing is that as a Linux Foundation, we don't start from scratch. You've probably heard of initiatives like OpenChain or SPDX, which have already gone through a standardization process and have become ISO standards. Um, this is great, but of course they were written before the Cyber Science Act, so we may have to update them. But that means we have a supply chain specification or supply chain recommendations and a format for, for providing SBOMs, et cetera. And we're going to start to build on these and combine them, for example, with the best practices developed at the Open Source Security Foundation, um, and then submit them through the Joint Development Foundation, another Linux Foundation project, um, as uh, specifications of community practices. Um, we are collaborating horizontally with um, many organizations, like um, Open Forum Europe in Brussels, to kind of reinforce our message, to align with others, and, and, and show a unified um, opinion represent a unified opinion of those participants. Um, and so with that, we have quite some, um, I would say quite some influence, um, but it's still quite some work that needs to be done here. Um, yeah, and then of course, um, we have um, a policy committee. I will mention a bit more about that later. And we are establishing more um, uh, special interest groups that will work to inform and develop shared positions Basically, what should we as Linux Foundation represent in Brussels, for example? And um, what can we give you as members as information to implement the act? So this was very high level. Um, let's go a bit into details. We have three work streams that we've currently identified. One is formalizing community specifications, this process that I've just carefully laid out. Um, there are three aspects to this, uh, or three stakeholders. There's the organization that provides the specifications or the best practices, this is the OpenSSF in this case. There's the Joint Development Foundation, which is our group that is accredited at ESO to submit um, publicly available specifications. And then we as the Linux Foundation are co co coordinating this whole process. 
Um, and the idea is we um, identify things like the, the, the security scorecard or the best practices batch that the OpenSSF have developed. We write them up in a way that can be accepted at ESO. We submit it there. And if that process concludes, then we have something that we can point to where we say these are community specifications on how, for example, vulnerability handling should be implemented, and they're actually formalized. And once that happens, um, these formalized specifications can then be referenced in upcoming standards like the ones for the CRA. So we have to go like this two-pronged approach where we say we take community specifications from being more or less informal to be accepted and formalized. And then we say, and now that they're formalized, you can actually start referencing to the EU. And there's a forum called Multi-Stakeholder Platform for ICT Standardization, where we engage. Um, and this is the forum that picks these standards for being referenced in the, uh, these specifications for being referenced in standards. And we're sitting on that too. So like, we're slowly starting to see a framework where we can support and drive the establishment of standards and then push for them being referenced. The second work stream, as I said earlier, um, is the one that is very difficult for the, for the Linux Foundation because of our diverse project setup. Um, so we would like to um, work towards unifying the practices of our projects and how they generate their documentation. Um, SBOMS is kind of the, the keyword here, but it's not only that. Um, and there is something called the OpenSSF Security Baseline. It's linked here. The slides, uh, slides are shared, so you can follow that. Um, and this is where we're starting. And then we have to advocate to our projects to, uh, to adopt these processes um, to provide this documentation with their releases. As I said, the challenge here is this kind of diverse set of tool chains and development processes. Um, but as requirements are becoming more solidified from a regulatory perspective, I think the projects will also be willing to adopt them. And if you look into the CRA, there is uh, something called voluntary attestation programs, basically um, upstream communities providing um, documentation with their releases aimed for, to support compliance by the manufacturers that integrate the software. Um, and this is something that is recommended in the CRA. It's not something that we are required to do, um, but of course we would like to implement that and this requires close collaboration between our members and us, because the, the needs that you as manufacturers have, um, we need to work with you to identify those and implement them in the processes. Okay, so, and then we have the, uh, the third work stream, which is providing guidance to the community. If you were in the panel discussion where we talked about our report on the, um, on the, kind of the environment in Europe that was just published, then one thing that we pointed out there is this uh, relatively high level of insecurity about the consequences from regulation um, in the community and also with our members. And so one aspect is to kind of cut through all the fog and provide more clear guidance on how we should implement this. And with that, we're going to kick off a research report now um, that will research the state of cybersecurity practices and um, what the gap is to the requirements from the CRA, and will end in recommendations and what manufacturers and open source communities can do to close this gap. Um, later, as the standards for the CRA are being published, we will work on training and certification programs, but we're not there yet. Like At the moment, we don't have enough information on how it will be implemented, so we can't drive this yet, but maybe a year from now, um, this is coming. Um, so, this providing guidance to the community works in, in probably two phases, I would say. One is creating awareness of the upcoming requirements, and then as they become more solidified, providing concrete training courses and certification programs. Um, I, I spoke a lot about the standards that we will have to develop. We, the overall community has to develop in support of the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, first of all, the standardization request, this is the request that the European Commission will send to the European Standards Development Organizations and say, please develop these standards, here's your timeline. This is still in draft stage, so we know roughly what is in there, um, but that has not been submitted to them yet, so they don't, don't have to, they don't start on the work yet. Um, since Senelec and Etsy will be the implementing organizations and they will invite stakeholders like us to work with them. 
Um, and what we have to be aware of is that many of the implementation details of the law will be in those standards. Um, the law is very high level, very generic. Um, everybody who reads it can probably say, I support the goals and, and most of the requirements there. Um, but how exactly it should be done and how you, for example, ship a password management software so that it's compliant with the CRA will be one of these standards. Um, there are two groups of standards. Um, one is uh, provides like horizontal requirements for all products, like how do you deliver a product with digital elements that has no known vulnerabilities, um, and then the, there's like about ten of them, and then the rest will be specific product groups, like what are the essential, essential cybersecurity requirements for a standalone or embedded web browser. Um, of course, the first one kind of is the foundation for the second part, second group. Um, that's why the standard development process is slightly. Uh, complicated. And it's difficult just to say this from right, right up front. We have three years of implementation period, and just to get all this work done in these three years will be difficult. Um, it's a lot of work. And as manufacturers, if you're making products, you can only start to be compliant with the standard once the standard is there. So it's a bit of a dependency. And if the standard working process takes quite some time, then that's the time that you don't have to implement it. So this is going to be a challenging environment. Um, in any way, we are engaging in this relatively actively, both in the um, discussions about the specific standards. There were consultations recently that we attended and provided feedback, and in the, at the high level in um, kind of advising the European Commission on how ICT standards should be developed. Uh, this is not the only environment where we have, or the only um, context in which we have new standards coming up. I'll give you two more examples here. One is uh, standards in support of AIDAS. Um, here we have a similar situation to what we heard before. There are inputs from, from um, what is called non-formal, non-recognized non, um, standards development organizations, which are interestingly the ones that make all the web standards, W3C, IETF. What does this mean? They're not recognized. Um, there are a few. European standards development organizations that are recognized as working with the European Commission in lawmaking. And IEEE is not, uh, IETF is not. So this may change in the future, but for now, um, that means that again here we have to go through this indirect process where we make specifications that come out of that um, more formalized and then bring them in and um, ask that they be considered in, in law. And um, similarly in the I Act, uh, we have a similar situation, quite um, not quite the same. First of all, the IAC is already enforced. Uh, sorry, is already in force. The implementation period is uh, starting to count down. The standard organization request is in place, so we're kind of a few steps further than with the Cyber Science Act. And the, pro the work is in progress already at uh, the Joint Technical Committee uh, 21 of Saint Saint Lake. And here the requirements begin to apply in late 27, uh, 26. Um, in this case, we are monitoring the standards development, but we do not expect a larger in impact on our projects from that. Um, and this is kind of the guiding principle for our engagement as Linux Foundation Europe in standards development processes is, does it affect our ecosystem and in what way? And then we try to ensure that um, there's no negative outcome. Uh, I mentioned a couple of times that we are working with, um, in, in different forums to uh, kind of make ourselves heard, to have impact. One is Open Forum Europe. Um, we are cooperate with them, we're members there, we're supporting the organization. Open Forum Europe is a group that um, works towards fostering open technologies in Europe. Nick is here, he gave a presentation yesterday, um, if you want to talk to them. Um, and we, of course, share this goal, so we work with OFE. And um, OFE also provides a very interesting su um, support for us, which is coordinates various open source stakeholders to have a joint face in Brussels. Um, it's called the Cyber Zonesac Task Force um, that they have formed, and we participate in this very willingly because it's nice and appreciated by the European Commission if we prevent, uh, present a unified um, feedback by the different open source stakeholders involved there um, to the lawmaking process. And the other thing I've mentioned is the multi-stakeholder platform on ICT standardization um, this is an, ex an appointed expert group um, that advises the European Commission on um, ICT standards development, to which we have applied and become, uh, were accepted. 
And now we're participating in this, and this is a very influential group that basically provides input as the European Commission drives the development processes. Um, this group is consulted and can provide um, recommendations. So this means that we have a quite good setup for um, what we need to achieve, what I've laid out. Um, but still, I want to point out that it's, uh, there's a lot of work coming, basically. So uh, your help is appreciated. Um, you will see a little bit how you can engage with that. Uh, before we get to that, what's the outlook? Um, so the work on our LF research report will start after this session. Hillary is here. She will work with me on this. Thank you. Um, the working title, which is way too long, so it will have to change, is Pathways to Cybersecurity Best Practices in Open Source, How the Zephyr and Yocto Projects Are Closing the Gap to, the, to Meeting the Requirements of the CRA. And the idea is that we're starting to work on this now. We have three months because we want to publish it in the second half of January and present it at FOSTA. And this is the idea is exactly to provide guidance to the community. The recommendations at the end of this report will be what we have identified as gaps in the current practices towards where we need to be. And hopefully the list is not too long. Let's see. Um, but at least it will be a good guide for all of you if you have to implement this. Uh, formalizing community specifications here, discussions are in, um, in progress, um, and the results to the more detailed plans will be shared in Q4. And when it comes to processes and tooling for upstream projects, we still have to work on this because of this aspect of diversity. Um, I have one announcement now, and that is we are launching an implementation group for the CRA, a special interest group, um, which is open to all our members. Um, so this is not a policy discussion group. This is a group where we want to um, work with you to implement very specific processes, um, guidelines, etc. maybe give input for the report that we're writing, for you as, uh, that, that, where you can, as members can give feedback to us, collaborate with us, and drive this process of implementing the CRA over the next three years. Um, mm -hmm. No extra fee, it's a member benefit, so um, we will launch this, the members will get an email in the next couple of weeks to, to sign up for this. Um, if you want to join this, this is a working group, so there will be work to be done, so just to be aware of that. Um, and then, yeah, I also have one more thing. Uh, we have a LF Europe policy committee. I have a couple of people who actively engage in that here in the room. Um, I would like to give just a quick update of what we have done since this was established almost a year ago. Um, we have regular meetings where we discuss upcoming regulation and the state of it. We review strategic EU programs and how we want to engage, like the Horizon Europe strategic plan. We do participate in EU consultations. So for example, we have submitted feedback to um, the potential reform of the European standardization system. And this group was influential in providing input on what we should um, do there. We, of course, prepare and review the MSP meetings, the things that I, the, the expert group that I've just uh, introduced. And we provide to our members, to the participants, regular updates on the EU policy timeline, like what's coming, etc. So you have a bit of a radar um, of the things to come. Um, people that participate in our group are quite happy about it. Uh, we have started to collaborate with the OpenSSF to make sure that we're not overlapping on cybersecurity topics. Um, and it's open for everybody who is a member in LF Europe or participant in LF Europe to participate. So all you have to do is send me an email and sign up. And yeah, and that, um, one more announcement based on yesterday's session. So yesterday, as you may have seen, we had the um, first and initial and already legendary um, open source in the public sector track. And um, we had great presentations there. And one thing that we announced is that we are forming a special interest group for public sector open source collaboration. And um, again, I mean, this is a, a working group. We're inviting those of you who are, have an interest in the public sector or public sector actors to work with us there. And the idea here is that we can provide a forum where it's easy to collaborate horizontally um, all over Europe. Um, no matter like what kind of agency you come from and what company you come from, this is kind of a neutral ground to say, can we create connections where the needs are the same and we can use the same software and develop it collaboratively, things like that. Um, and the intention is that we are next year running this open source in the public sector track again at the Open Source Summit, and the group here will be the 
program committee for next year's session. So that's a, that's a certain motivation to join. Um, if you want to influence the track next year, then this is your way. Um, that's what I have prepared for you today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs>